This video contains mild nudity and may not be suitable for children. Of existence, everything that has been or ever will be, begins within a singularity of creation. The Green Mother of the Pearl Universe gives birth to new realities each and every 10,000 years. These realities, her children, are called ages. And when newborn ages exploded with vibrant life, Simultaneously, Elder Ages decayed and died, devoured by the inevitability of a singularity of destruction. Two sides of the same coin. Each new age brings with it new paradigms, new laws of existence, and new life. In the time of this telling, three ages reigned supreme. The Age of Celestials, from which dark, boundless space brought galactic travel, psionic telepathy, Cthulian ancients, Titans, cosmic phenomena, and horrors beyond imagining. Followed by the Age of Magic, when spellcraft, enchantments, magical life forms, monstrous creatures, mythical worlds, in our realms and the supernatural were conjured into being. And finally, the infant age, the age of gods, through which divinity came, primal energy, souls, artifacts, religion, worshippers, faith, and the pantheons. The age of celestials. And with the celestial age came the great explorers. Taxi and mentalists tapped worlds with their minds. Tantaluvian shipwrights and their enslaved Cthulian beasts pierced space, time, and dimensions to discover a thousand worlds and enslave them. But the noise of their exploration echoed through the universe, awakening long dormant powers. The Tanaluvians foolishly dared imprison Cthulians and other cosmic terrors to power their fleets. Quite naturally, the sheer audacity of such an act antagonized the great Old Ones. And for that, they paid the ultimate price. Tanaluvia was torn asunder. Its people fled, scattered across the multiverse. Homeless. In the anarchy that followed, a new age was born. The Age of Magic. The singularity of creation spewed forth a seed, infinitesimally small. Immediately it sprouted, fueled by potent planar magics. It grew and grew and grew. The Universe Tree. Its mighty branches swept through the stars, its roots dug deep through the galaxies. The cosmos evolved. Planets were replaced with metaphysical dimensions, worlds, and planes. Dark places of evil where demons and devils reigned. Hell. Proto-worlds governed by law, by chaos, and energy beings of extraordinary power 
came into existence. Elementare, lords of fire, terra, wind and water, sat upon colossal thrones of their own elements. Around each, an elemental world, alive with frightening power. Across thousands of these worlds, life abundant evolved with incredible divergent purpose. The elves. They cherished life above everything and the beauty of nature. Then there were orcs, born of hatred, who sought dominance through, above all else, death. Of these many worlds, one shone brighter than the rest. Chaldea, the birthplace of dwarves, who flourished in this new age of magic. Oh yes, the dwarves mastered Chaldea, and for a time, peace and prosperity was all they knew. Highly adept at stone and engineering, they were monarchs of their own construction. And upon Chaldea, dwarves built an empire rivaling anything the universe had ever known. But the dwarves of Chaldea were not alone. Distant shores across the great sea thrived another race of creatures. Magnificent creatures. Creatures of beauty, of intellect, of divine purpose. Dragons. These creatures also called Chaldea home. But dragons were unwilling to share Chaldea's precious resources with materialistic, hoarding dwarves. Although both groups coveted Chaldea's mineral resources, a dragon's appetite was not driven by greedy personal gain, but rather sustenance. It wasn't long before the elder serpents set their eyes on dwarven wealth, easy pickings to devour. But the dwarves, resolute and brave, refused to submit to the will of the dragons. Thus, the great claw hammer war ensued. The dragons brought unimaginable devastation and destruction to the dwarves. In testament to dwarven fortitude, they endured, hiding, taking refuge deep underground. But the dragons were only momentarily thwarted. To win this claw hammer war, dragons required help, armies to fight the greedy dwarves. So they sought out Tanaluvians on distant worlds. Dragons forged contracts with Tanaluvian shipping guilds to bring mercenary armies to Chaldea. It was a pact that would transform Chaldea bringing the humanoid races of man, orc, and all manner of evil, vile things. The dragon strategy paid off. Soon, there was no place that the dwarves could borrow that these new enemies couldn't follow. Finally, on a dread-filled morning, deep in the heart of Niche, the valiant dwarves made their last stand. His army assembled Surinam led the final charge, and the dwarven race came face to face with their own extinction. Let there be no doubt, Surinel intended to do just that, end the dwarves that day. But something happened, shifted. Something neither he nor any of the other dragons had anticipated. Merithia. During this claw hammer war, Merithian grew to admire the dwarves and their iron-clad determination, their fortitude, their resolve. He did not wish to see them perish. So he became their champion. And Surinel, he didn't like that. He didn't like that at all. Surinel and Merithian. 
they did battle. The clash of dragons generated a blinding white light, swallowing the room whole. Then, in the collision of light and sound, Marithian and the dwarves were gone. And the Clawhammer War was over. With victory came spoils. Dragons gorged and gorged, their bellies became full on dwarven wealth. And along with these spoils, something else happened. Dragons slumbered, as only dragons are wont to do. As they snoozed, the world changed yet again. Absent dragons to serve and dwarves to fight, the remnants of the humanoid armies dispersed across Chaldea, and evil creeped. So much so, it wasn't long before human clans took to warring with each other. By miracle or fate's blessing, the dwarven race had somehow escaped extinction by the barest of margins. The numbers, petty and few, no one paid them any mind except predators hungry to feed on their corpses. The dwarves that remained were forced to take refuge among human settlements and were treated a little better than vermin. For the next thousand years, Chaldea was a world of conflict. Nothing but endless war and bloodshed. Corrupt kingdoms vying for prominence. These were the dark times. Foul and evil beasts of every variety bred and suckered on the powerful magics of Chaldea. Then, as if by magic itself, from out of this cradle of filth, rose a great and cunning warrior, Torcaster Cardava. With but a simple sword and the arrogance and strength to use it, Cordava rose in prominence seeking exhilarating adventure. His days of adventure were disjointed yet carefree. Cordava dined on carnal desires and reveled in death attacking each with equal parts recklessness and zeal. When he achieved all that he could achieve from the hilt of a blade, he took a new act to the world stage. Yes, Cordava was more than just an intrepid graver with a strong arm. He was a brilliant general, a shrewd politician, and charismatic leader. But that was not enough. One day, Cordava launched his most ambitious gambit yet, forging an unstoppable alliance with the Drazzledar. Now the dragons learned to fear Cordava and dared not test his power, for it was absolute. Cordava finally united all of Chaldea under a single banner. And for his achievement, the Ma'at god set elevated Cordava to the ranks of the Divine. Initially, Cordava's reign elicited apprehensive dread. Many worried that he would drag Chaldea further into chaos and war. But instead, Cordava brought peace and prosperity, unifying all under one grand religion. Chaldeans loved their new emperor, and Chaldeans feared their new emperor. And for good reason. He abolished freedom of religion. All were invited to exult in the divine authority of Set, the one true everlasting god. In payment for obedience, the rule of Cordava eradicated plagues and diseases. His 40 years of peace generated affluence, security, and bountiful harvests. On Chaldea, there was no better exemplar. 
the age of gods had arrived. Who's there? I have a sword. If I had a real sword, father never hit us again. He's calling the slavers on us. You stop! Is she dead? Freedom never tasted so soggy.